Welcome back to this week's edition of Falcon Focus. With me again is my guest, Chris Sanders, legal advisor to Simmons College of Kentucky, but more importantly, he is the project manager for our Kerner Commission 2.0. So I'm gonna ask Chris to explain how we are a part of it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Vaughn. In 1967, there was massive unrest uh, in American cities. And the president, president at that time was Lyndon Johnson. Johnson pulled together a Blue Ribbon Commission and, and charged them with three things to say. What happened? Why did it happen? Mm -hmm. How do we prevent it from ever happening again? Mm -hmm. The chair of the commission was uh, Governor Otto Kerner of Illinois. And it, the Kerner Commission then took a year effort to uh, answer those three questions. Right. When they came back in early 1968, they came back with an amazing, frankly blistering report about the state of America, the state of poor America, the state of black America, and called for sweeping change, okay. massive change in politics, legislation, economic development, culture, in transportation, in jobs. Uh, Dr. King got a chance to read the first draft before, before, before he died. Mm -hmm. And the report came out not long after he passed. And here's what happens next. President Johnson for re-election. Mm -hmm. Nixon's elected president. And the Kerner Commission report literally goes in a drawer. It's the, it, it had called for sweeping change. Those changes were not implemented. Can you tell us about some of the changes that were called for? It, the biggest thing is massive public investment okay. uh, in, uh, to, to com combat the worst of, of America's behavior and discrimination and harassment and disinvestment and redlining. And so fast forward to 2020, do we see change? Do we see change? And how much has that changed? It's almost, almost like the elephant in the room what? is exactly. this sort of thing and the issues that bring us to this point. It was, the, it was something that we saw in the streets of Louisville after the police murder of Breonna Taylor. Uh, President Cosby looks out across the town and goes, this doesn't just look like 2020. This reminds us of 67 and 68. Okay. He pulls, pulls out his old copy of Kerner Commission report, mm -hmm. dusts it off and says, the past is present and it's time now to implement the changes that Otto Kerner's commission called for. So uh, Kerner Commission 2.0 was born. Uh, our governor, Andy Bashir, uh -huh. uh, started talking with us about this commission said let me help you construct a blue ribbon commission okay. made okay. up of leading citizens to do this when did these first conversations take part how long has it been going on about a year uh, this this these conversations were happening in summer of last year uh, Kerner 2.0 was created late last year just about not quite a year ago mm -hmm. so we've been doing our work ever since uh, we built that commission carefully because we want it built out of the kind of folks in leadership in our town that could actually make a difference. Well, uh, tell our audience some yeah. of the members on that committee. This is where where a guy gets in trouble when you leave some name out. We will <laughs> list. We will. Uh, we will list all of them on screen. But I'll, what we're going to do is I'll, mention a few. I'll do my best. Uh, our commissioners include uh, Russ Cox, the chairman and CEO of Norton Healthcare. Mm -hmm. Jim Spradlin, Chairman and President and CEO of Park Community Credit Union. Geraldine Green, uh, Chief Communications Officer for Yum Brands. Steve Traeger, okay. Chairman and CEO of uh, Republic Bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, his, in his support, William Summers V, yes, exactly. who is a great help. Uh, Mary Ellen Wiederwall, yes. uh, who has uh, provided uh, uh, great leadership in economic development to the Metro Louisville and now runs El Home. Yes. Uh, the uh, city CDFI. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Barry Allen, Barry Allen, our great friend, mm -hmm. CEO of the Gaines Foundation. Uh, Ashley Watts, yeah. CEO of Kentucky Chamber, 
And of course, our friend, Dr. Cynthia, Cynthia Campbell, a retired president of the McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago. Dr. Campbell's especially important to us because she's seen what community investment in the south side of Chicago okay. has done. And uh, it is a great, it's a great institutional memory for what Louisville could be mm -hmm. as a result of her experience there. I hope I haven't left anybody we out. We have left off a couple that I can <laughs> think of. Bob Rousenfall. Bob, Rous Bob Rousenfall, mm -hmm. a great friend and benefactor, of course. And we have led by and our one and only. I, I, was, I was holding the chairman the last, <laughs> I almost forgot. Our chairperson, Nikki Lanier, uh, who's uh, the uh, local principal officer for the United States Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. If you want to know where money comes from, it yeah. comes from Nikki. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> In this community. It's right. And so uh, she provides great leadership uh, to this stellar group of people. Now tell us about how Simmons is involved and what we do um, to keep this commission or restart yeah. this commission. Uh, Kerner 2.0 is a project at Simmons College. Mm -hmm. And so... Simmons resources it uh, in terms of providing staff support, mm -hmm. logistical support. Uh, it uh, it has its own independence, but it wouldn't, it of course, wouldn't be if it weren't for Simmons College. Uh, and that starts starts with Dr. Cosby's vision, with with Nikki's leadership, uh, with some time I give us to project management. Yeah. Uh, to our new Vice President Candace Holt yes. uh, and has provided great support there too. We've been meeting monthly. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you kind of what the work is and what we're doing. We've been meeting monthly uh, since that time around what we call five commitments. Something as big as uh, resetting America on the, the path that, that Johnson's Commission called for is much bigger than any one organization can do. But our five commitments are important. We call them education-centric. Mm -hmm. First, teacher education. Mm -hmm. uh, all of our schools, especially our public schools, need a lot more black school teachers. Uh, we've devoted ourselves to student scholarships mm -hmm. and the growth there. Uh, Nikki's uh, favorite is the rebuilding of the black middle class, mm -hmm. which has everything to do with employment internships, placement, retention, and success mm -hmm. in all our workplaces. Uh, asset mapping yes. with Dr. So uh, Dr. Uh, Nancy C., mm -hmm. Chair of the Simmons Sociology Department, mm -hmm. and uh, Councilman Jacory Arthur, yes. also on our faculty. Yes. They are doing an amazing job in, ma in asset mapping uh, West End's assets, starting mm -hmm. with the Parkland neighborhood, exactly. but moving on to nine neighborhoods after that. Now, for those people who may not understand the asset mm -hmm. mapping part, because I remember when I first heard it, I thought asset mapping. Can you explain a little yeah. bit what that really means so people can understand? This is fresh because it was recently up before the commission just last week. So sometimes we forget just what hidden jewels there are in any community. Exactly. If you'll do your work, you can put those together and then you map them like on a Google map, on, ah. a, on a grid, right? So uh, Simmons students under uh, Councilman Arthur's leadership, under Dr. Uh, C's tutelage, went out in the community, okay. knocked on doors and said, where are the assets in your neighborhood? And of course, it wasn't hard to find using the usual maps mm -hmm. to find uh, maps like businesses and churches and nonprofits and where street leadership is, where the parks are, okay. that kind of thing. And the community exactly. centers and places like That's that. That's right. Did you know there are no parks in Parkland? Except There are no I, parks I'm in I'm shocked. Parkland. Why get, is it named get, Parkland? It's getting better, but at current, <laughs> under, thanks to Chairman Arthur, but until until we have uh, the new Parkland Forum there, and just until of okay. this thing, there are no parks in Parkland, that has to change. Do we know how large, how large is Parkland? <sighs> Distance-wise, as, as you grid this thing out, mile and a half north to south from Broadway, going down south, mm -hmm. south of, south uh, of Algonquin, east to west, you know, basically from uh, not quite as far as Park Duval, okay. but then over up against the California neighborhood. So did right it here. start out with parks 
because it was named park and I then the parks got covered I suppose. and taken over by development. I uh, you it makes you and wonder. That would yeah. become maybe I'm just guessing. A little a little bit of a little bit of history would be good there. <laughs> it would be it, great. But what we, what we did find out is there's a lot there are twenty some churches in Parkland. Okay. You know, there's uh, businesses there is community investment, mm -hmm. not as much as there needs to be, but more than you're, you think of when you just think of Parkland. Okay. And when you know that, then you can build upon that. So we'll have this wonderful interactive map that can be used by residents, okay. can be used by folks who are regular visitors, like church members okay. in the Parkland neighborhood, and of course for businesses and economic development. Now where do we hope to publicize the asset mapping piece. It's going to live at Simmons, you know, virtually live at Simmons, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's hopefully useful uh, in an open source fashion to anybody that needs it. Now, as, um, as an academic institution, we're doing these sorts of things. Is it going to fall at Simmons under our sociology, our history, well, or all of the above? For, for asset mapping, definitely under sociology mm -hmm. and perhaps under history. For things like building the black middle class, that's all in our student engagement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's all about our new career services staff. Mm -hmm. It's all about uh, making sure that we build cohorts of students and then alumni. Exactly. And are out mm -hmm. there in the workforce so that those folks not just get a job, but also uh, prom uh, get promoted and survive and stay exactly, and thrive. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. what is it looking like now? Are we... We're in the latter stages okay. of the Kerner Commission's work. Uh, and the next thing that will come out of all this is our is the Kerner 2.0 report. Okay, and when with is major that recommendations do? early next year. Okay, okay. Yeah. And who is are we will will Simmons continue to champion this once we publicize it, promote it? We don't want it to die on the vine. The thinking is, and this is in early stages, so do not hold me to this. Uh -huh. Is that this will be sort of an an, an annual uh, update? Okay. That 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 the champions uh, from these various areas. Uh, we'll gather uh, you know, on a regular basis to report in, to, to oversee, and to continue to drive uh, the agenda that, that, that uh, the commissioners have set. So as you're having these conversations with the business and community leaders, do you feel like, one, they're on the same page with us, and two, they're committed to do a little bit more Very for much, the neighborhood? Yeah. Very much so. Uh, and, had a good conversation, for example, around teacher education. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, some of our folks, either on the commission or related to the commission, will end up being advisories to the new teacher education initiative at mm -hmm. Simmons. We've got this amazing thing happening. Your, 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 your viewers probably already know to yeah. some degree. But uh, in partnership with Jefferson County Public Schools, mm -hmm. in partnership now with uh, other schools in town, uh, we're on a fast track. Mm -hmm to uh, start our own teacher education program, to work with other schools so that teachers will start at Simmons, finish up under teacher education at other places, and then build our own teacher education initiative. Exactly. So that we will have many more teachers and administrative personnel uh, that look like the students they serve. Okay. And, and yeah. tell our audience how important it is to have teachers who look like who we serve. I think it matters in in important moments in a child's life, in a teenager's life, they have leaders, disciplinarians, role models mm -hmm. that are that are like who they are. And I'll, I'll say this too, as a white man in this space, I think it's really important for white students to have black leadership. I agree. That it just matters that in those in those moments for mm -hmm. for kids as they're coming up, mm -hmm. that they understand black women and men as leaders, disciplinarians, and role models and inspirers. And I agree with that because I remember when as a kid, Miss Forrest mm. was one of my first black teachers in North Carolina. And a part of the reason I'm at Simmons is because I went to an HBCU. I mm -hmm. love HBCUs. At the time in my life, that was what I needed. And we have 101, as we all know. And you've probably heard my story before. Um, I went to an HBCU. But one other thing I do on the side of working at Simmons, which I love, uh, I also am a substitute teacher oh. at a private school here in Kentucky, okay. in Louisville, mm -hmm. because there are not enough people who look like me in yeah. my son's 
classrooms across yes. your school. Right. So I wanted to be a part of the solution mm -hmm. and become a substitute teacher. Good. And I yeah. love it because it not only gives, like you say, students who look like me or my son uh, the role models, but it also gives white students mm -hmm. uh, enlightenment into blacks in education space. Mm -hmm. And I love it. I'm able to share with the students or just not even share, but they're able to just see me and see that we are all inclusive right. at the school. So I'm hoping we'll do a great job with that. I know we will uh, with the leadership that we've been provided and that program should be in place in fall of 2022. I, 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 the work is, is getting underway right now. Okay. There's, yeah. There are, are uh, uh, several important folks that are devoted to that. I think we're gonna see the first uh, tangible results, you know, fall of 2022. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna take a short break uh, there's so much more for us to talk about, and when we return, we'll continue our conversation about the Kerner Commission and what the impacts of the study and uh, will be. In 1967 and 2020 are very similar. I am for law and order. I am the law and order candidate. Back then it was black power. Today it's Black Lives Matter. However trouble they may be, looting and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. But what we are now seeing on the streets of our cities has nothing to do with justice. There is a uh, patience that people had with their struggle 52 years ago. Well, in my opinion, it just left from frustration, you know. And people will not be that patient today. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. So if you want us to do better, then damn it, you do better. President Lyndon Johnson appointed an 11-member advisory commission on civil disorders aimed to identify the root causes. 1967, riots broke out in all of the major cities in America, including here in Louisville, Kentucky. And these riots had a devastating effect. They were called riots, but they were really rebellions against systemic and structural injustice. The Kerner Report makes clear that the civil unrest in 1967, mirroring that in 2020, is not based on the idea of overthrowing the American government. This is a statement that people want to participate more fully in American democracy. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. The Kerner Report, the only study in American history formed by the government which established the reality of systemic racism. They clearly said in this report, white America created this situation. And guess what? White America is maintaining. The basic conclusion of the Kerner Commission Report was that our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. One of the tragedies of the 20th century was that President Johnson did not act on the recommendations that were made in the report. And here we are, 52 years later, and what, what do we see? The killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, David McEntee have led people in more than 2,000 American cities to take to the streets in justifiable protest. The best time for Kerner Commission II would have been in 1968. The second best time for Kerner Commission II is today. Simmons College of Kentucky has recently announced the formation of the Kerner Commission 2.0, not to duplicate the work of the original, but to pick up the mantle and begin the work that was laid out. And on today, the 53rd anniversary, I'm offering my support to the work of the Kerner Commission 2.0. Many organizations are putting out resolutions, but what we see happening between Simmons College 
of Kentucky and Kentucky State University is resolved. They are taking action to make a difference. Kentucky's only private HBCU and Kentucky's only public HBCU joining hands to work together for the betterment of the Commonwealth and the nation in which we live. This is our moment to take action for long, long overdue justice. As a society, we have got to figure out how to break this cycle of tragedy and violence and institutional racism, and the only way we can do it is together. And that's why this partnership is so important. That's why the launching of Kerner 2.0 is so important. This initiative is going to have four targets. The first is to educate the community about black issues. When people from outside of the community see problems taking place within the community or even situations that they believe are problems, they come in with what we call a deficit-based approach to solving those problems. And that deficit-based approach, it takes for granted that the community's broken. It takes for granted that the community has nothing to offer. That is not true. Scattered throughout West Louisville are indigenous, community-based institutions that are doing great things. The reason why the community is still strong is because of these institutions that many in the larger community has not taken the time to find out about and to be quite frankly sometimes don't have confidence in because of biases. Rutgers scholar Nancy DiTomaso pointed out the difference between formalized structural racism and an informal racism. Today racism is maintained not primarily by what white people and white institutions and philanthropy and government does against black people. But it's what philanthropy does for white people that they will not do for black people. Tremendously discouraging. So the impact of that philanthropic redlining goes from year to year and decade to decade. And sadly, it can be traced from generation to generation. Racial isolation is one of our enemies. When people don't see people that don't look like them, they become distrustful. The more we are integrated as a society, the more brilliant we will be. And so this partnership with Simmons College of Kentucky has been so important and we're going to get better and continue that development for years to come. And I think it will be, I know it will be a game changer for us in our racial equity policy and getting more African American people to the black. What we're saying, let's look at what we have in the community already. And if we have something that's working, then let's build on it. Let's support it. No one knows a community and the needs of a community like the people that live in that community. The commission will help the larger community understand what is there in West Louisville to raise awareness throughout the state about the assets. Will you realize that we offer value that this community has value, not only for Louisville, but for the larger whole United States, then when you're coming in, you're sharing your assets. You're investing in people that have the potential to make your life better. Welcome back to this week's edition of Falcon Focus. With me again is my guest, Chris Sanders, legal advisor to Simmons College of Kentucky. But more importantly, he is the project manager for our Kerner Commission 2.0. So Chris, continuing our conversation, I want to go back to the Kerner Commission 2.0 committee mm -hmm. and uh, remind our viewers, uh, some of the people involved. Okay, great. We, this is what happens when you don't look at your list. 
I, I, I left off, I left off, so sorry, so sorry, uh, Christopher Johnson, who is heading up uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, for the Humana Corporation, uh, and is involved heavily with us as a champion regarding career services. Uh, Commitment 3 is all about building the black middle class, okay. and uh, his work uh, uh, is in that area of, of employment, internships, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, retention, success, promotion. I, I do want to give great thanks to his predecessor on the commission, Walter Woods, CEO of the Humana Foundation. Uh, Walter's leaving Humana, yes. uh, and, and that's all good. And so uh, in that, we passed the, the baton to Christopher Johnson, mm -hmm. who's doing a great job. Yeah, we will miss Walter, uh, but before Walter left as uh, part of his diligence on the community, he provided us with a lot of Humana volunteers. Yes. And as I happen to serve up the scholarship piece of the Kerner Commission, we have had some wonderful volunteers on that uh, part of right. the Casey 2 uh, mm -hmm. Commission because they sat in all the meetings, they provided some great advice and counsel, mm -hmm. and we will be moving forward with a lot of what they uh, recommended. One of the things with scholarships is we need to do a better job at Simmons of letting the audience and the community know who our students are. Right. Uh, that was one of the recommendations. Another recommendation was post our scholarships, mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to be doing. And one thing about it, um, since the Breonna Taylor, the racial uprisings that have been going on in this country, uh, a lot of people have been paying attention to HBCUs. Yes. And we're in HBCU, and we've been getting a lot of support. So locally, we may have gotten a quarter of a million dollars in scholarship before the uprisings, but we're tracking right now to almost double that. Mm. And I think that's a wonderful uh, statement to the work that we do at Simmons College of Kentucky and to our community right. who realizes it's important to pour into our students. And each of those uh, commitments that we have with the KC2 will help us in each of those areas and more importantly, help us button up the areas in which we need to improve upon. Right. So I'm really, very happy to be a part of that. And we again want to thank Humana for all their work there and the entire commissioners That's on right. this group. So let, let's talk about how here we are in 2021 and we are still dealing with some of the same racial issues. Um, what do you attribute that to? And, and, and what I think we all know what we need to do better. So why are we still so sluggish mm -hmm. with doing better? That's a Gordian knot, and you could pull a lot of threads, <laughs> and, e and each of them would be would be an explanation. Mm -hmm. I think e we should take baby steps. So where yeah. can we make an impact? That's right. I mean, you you can you can lay the trouble at the feet of disinvestment. Mm -hmm. You can lay the mm -hmm. at you can lay it at the feet of government dysfunction. You can say it's as simple as people people still discriminate, yeah, all uh, right. and uh, whether that's in out and out bigotry or bias or unconscious bias or stereotyping, all the ways that discrimination presents uh, white supremacy and white privilege, uh, all those things contribute to the fact that things just don't change like they should mm -hmm. and as fast as they mm -hmm. should. Um, some stuff is just structural. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, 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 in, the concerns that the Kerner Commission initially in the 60s addressed was redlining. Ah. Uh, you know, where neighborhoods uh, were government mm -hmm. constructed such that people who look like this stay here mm -hmm. and people who live, look like that can buy there. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. After yeah. speak on that, because I yeah. I was in a discussion just the other day mm -hmm. with a gentleman who was kind of you know where people blame you for your where you are your mm -hmm. existence, and I was trying to tell him about all the history and the systemic yeah. issues that have plagued mm -hmm. the black community, and so you know he made excuses, uh, but I don't think people understand what redlining looked like a little more back then. then. Yeah, so. Before the 1930s and the New Deal, there was people still were segregating based upon race, uh, but it wasn't organized. It wasn't government directed. Right. Uh, 
As part of massive investment in housing that starts in the 30s and runs up especially into the 50s, we made assigning people to various neighborhoods by their race governed by law. Mm -hmm. Richard Rothstein, the theory that governed, governed by, by law. law, directed by law, organized by law. law. Richard Rothstein wrote a book called The Color yeah. of Law. Mm -hmm. And it just means that here's the map. The government's going to draw the map. The real estate brokers are going to abide by the map. And inside the map, we color red. That's where, God forgive me, black people live. Mm -hmm. Here's the yellow section and the blue section and the section. And this was designed. This was all, it was it all was carefully designed. mapped out in every city in the mm -hmm. country. So I want everybody to understand, yeah. this was designed it was all, well, to put blacks in certain areas. Because where I'm from in North Carolina, yeah. there was a little section where my family mm -hmm. could buy and stay in that section. That section still exists today. Yeah. But at the same time, it was only one of the few places where blacks right. could actually live and buy, purchase homes. And so it, when you organize things that way and you put all people into an organized sessions, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, the, uh, if you, and you say, well, this property is bad and that property is good, mm -hmm. partly because it's who lives there, because it's in real estate, it's location, location, yeah, location. Exactly, location. Then if you organize things that way, it doesn't matter in some respects whether the law changes or not because property ownership is, is embedded in the generations. Mm -hmm. And so you can segregate communities long after legal segregation is illegal. It just because it just stays and persists mm -hmm. in real, especially in real estate. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, the Kerner Commission back in the 60s led to legislation which outlaws redlining, outlaws blockbusting. Uh, doesn't mean it didn't still happen. Right, but and, and yeah. there was a change in the administration right. uh, in Washington. Mm -hmm. So things probably got became dormant, it, forgotten. Right, and, and, and even even if even if it's not. Even on the books, it's no longer illegal. It doesn't mean it's not practically right. still true. Right. Let's talk about right. how de-investment, I mean, that mm -hmm. would cause de-investment right. in communities of color. Yeah. So that started to happen. That, you know, that, that happens because, you know, real estate is everything in America. In a capitalist society, real estate is, a, is, is one of the primary build, building blocks of anything in, a, in an economy. And so if this is the good real estate and that's the bad real mm -hmm. estate. You put a value. You, you as, you've assigned a yeah. value and part of that value is based on race. Exactly. Then a house that looks like this and a house that looks like that, they look just alike. This one's worth a lot more than that one is because of where it is. It's on one side of the street or one mm -hmm. neighborhood over, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the goal of the, one of the goals of the KC2 Commission is to create mm -hmm. awareness Yes. And then what do we consider post-action points after we get the report out? Uh, our particular commission is education-centric, okay. right? Teacher education, scholarships, jobs, asset mapping, and raising the visibility of our historically black colleges okay. uh, and universities and their importance in our communities. Mm -hmm. HBCUs are important yes. to black students. Th Chris, I want to thank you for being my guest today and for bringing all this wonderful information to our audience. If you have any questions, please give us a call at Simmons College of Kentucky. Uh, our number is 502-776-1443. We can get you in touch with Chris and the staff at Simmons College of Kentucky to explain more. But in the meantime, be on the lookout for the results that come from this committee. So again, thank you for being my guest today on Falcon Focus. I hope you learned something. And next time, stay tuned. Go Falcons. <laughs>